I don't need to introduce uh, Professor Pepperman anymore, but today we have the second of the Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, the title is uh, uh, Conformal Invariance, uh, conformal maybe? invariance of Riemannian Metric. And please. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, okay. Uh, we'll start with a little anecdote. I gather that um, uh, some time ago, uh, a, a clever student at the University of Chicago complained uh, uh, that the grading was unfair because the grades were not distributed uh, normally. Okay. Now, uh, I, I, I find myself facing a, a similar problem because I'm told that there's not a normal distribution in, in the background of the audience, that I should, I should beware that there are people in the audience who know a lot of differential geometry and people in the audience who don't know any differential geometry, and I will try to make the lecture not absolutely useless to, to either group. Okay, so um, <clears throat> with apologies to those who know a lot of differential geometry, uh, the beginning will be a very quick uh, description of what a Riemannian manifold is and, and what you can do with it. Uh, but before, before even that happens, let, let me just explain um, what, uh, what the problems are, what I hope to achieve, what, what the setting is. So um, let's say in, in two dimensions, in, in one complex variable, um, uh, we're used to the idea of making conformal maps. And so you have, let's say, one domain which is mapped conformally to another domain. And the mapping of the one domain to the other uh, preserves angles. Or for instance, one could make uh, a map of, of uh, some country on the surface of the Earth. And this map uh, cannot be perfect because the, uh, uh, the Earth is, is not flat. But nevertheless, one can preserve something. One could try to make an equal area. Um, map or one, one could try to preserve various things and a popular choice uh, is a conformal map in which two lines, uh, of course there's no such thing as a straight line, but let's say on the surface of the earth two lines, uh, two curved lines will meet at a certain angle and then if the map is conformal uh, then the corresponding lines meet at the same angle on the map as, as they do on the surface of the earth. And there are lots and lots of conformal maps. Um, on the other hand, let's take another two-dimensional problem. Let's, let's think about two-dimensional surfaces and let us ask whether one two-dimensional surface uh, is isometric to another. And, uh, that is, is there a map from one uh, curved surface to another curved surface which preserves exactly the length of, of any curve that happens to lie on the surface? And in, in very sharp contrast to the question of the conformal maps, for isometries, the answer is almost always no. So for example, um, uh, an ellipsoid is not, uh, is not isometric to a sphere. Geometry on the surface of a sphere is completely different from geometry uh, on the surface of an ellipsoid. And you can tell that even looking at an arbitrarily small neighborhood on uh, comparing a small neighborhood on the ellipsoid with a small neighborhood on the sphere. They are just different. Um, and, and so there are pointwise invariants for the, for the uh, problem of uh, isometries. There is, for example, the Gaussian curvature. That's the most basic. Uh, Gauss proved in roughly the year 1800 that, uh, that if two surfaces in R3 are isometric to each other, then uh, at corresponding points under the isometry, they have the same Gaussian curvature. Um, Gaussian curvature on the sphere is constant. Gaussian curvature on an ellipsoid is not constant. OK. Uh, now, uh, that's, that, that's background. Now let's think about dimension greater than 2. So already, let us say, in, in, well, in dimensions 3 and higher, and from now on I'm in dimensions 3 and higher unless unless they say otherwise, um, we could ask, for example, what, what conformal maps are there? So for instance, suppose that you take a domain in, let's say, three dimensions, and you map it somehow to some other domain in three dimensions, and you would like to make this map conformal. That is, if two curves uh, happen to intersect in, in this domain, then the angle that they make is equal to the angle that their images make uh, over here. 
okay? Uh, and whereas in, so whereas in two dimensions there are a lot of such maps, in three dimensions there are very few such maps. It is a classical theorem of the 19th century, I think due to Liouville, that every such uh, map on an arbitrarily small neighborhood, every conformal map defined on an arbitrarily small neighborhood of let's say R3 or of Rn for n greater than two, any such map must already be a linear fractional transformation. And in fact, not all linear fractional transformations are allowed, uh, but only uh, certain special ones have this property. So, so three dimensions are much, much more rigid than two dimensions, and the situation is much closer uh, to, to uh, the study of, is of isometric maps in two dimensions than it is to the study of conformal maps in two dimensions. All right. So the goal of, um, of, of uh, the, the problems I'll discuss, the, the goal is to associate numbers to a point analogous to the Gaussian curvature, but in higher dimensions with the idea that these numbers are going to be, roughly speaking, uh, invariant under conformal maps so that they can be used to distinguish one, uh, um, one domain or one manifold from another uh, to distinguish them uh, where equivalence means conformal equivalence. Okay, so that, that's the goal. Now I'll be talking about two kinds of um, invariants. So, so again, I, I want to associate a number to uh, to a conformal structure, all right? So the first, the first way of associating a number will be entirely local. Given a point and given a conformal manifold, and I'll describe exactly what that is, uh, I, I want a formula which produces a number at one point. And it should be, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in something that can be computed explicitly, and so I imagine that this this number should not be described as the solution of a, of a differential equation or a variational problem or anything else, but it should just be given by a completely elementary formula. Um, all right, and so there's the notion of a conformal pointwise invariant. That's the first problem that I, I want to talk about. In the second problem, uh, in, in the second problem, I'm going to allow myself to take an elementary formula and associate a number to each point, but then I, I, but then I will integrate the number, okay? And in the second problem, um, the, uh, uh, what, what I would like to be invariant is not so much the value of the, uh, I mean, what you get from the elementary formula at any one point, but rather the integral of this number. And so that's, a, of course, a much weaker condition and, and the problems that I want to pose are find all possible conformally invariant elementary formulas where a conformal invariant can either be uh, an elementary formula associated to a single point or the integral of an elementary formula over the whole space, whatever the whole space is. Now, what is the whole space? It's time to do the little introduction to differential geometry. So, so this... Um, the subject is going to live on a Riemannian manifold. So this is an n-dimensional Riemannian manifold with a metric G. So let me say some words, and then let me spend five or 10 minutes explaining to the group of people who, are, I mean, who, who haven't studied differential geometry just what the words mean, okay? So we have a Riemannian manifold. So here's the manifold, here's the Riemannian metric, and the Riemannian metric has uh, Let's see. All right. So it, it has curvature. It has Ricci and scalar curvature. And these things, and it has a notion of, of covariant differentiation. Okay? Now, now what are these things? Uh, all right. So now I should try to make this reasonable and uh, uh, comprehensible, but not bore the experts and so on. Uh, there is an example with which I cannot compete. This, this, these concepts are due to Riemann, and Riemann uh, uh, first introduced them in an amazing lecture which he was required to give in order to qualify to be a professor at Göttingen. And uh, he gave this lecture to the entire faculty at, at Göttingen, um, most of whom were not particularly interested in or knowledgeable about mathematics. And um, this, this is conceivably the best math lecture ever given. Uh, but it, so I, I, maybe the best thing I could do would be to read it word, word for word, uh, but unfortunately that would take about an hour. 
So, uh, well, anyway, all right. So, all right, a Riemannian map. All right, so first of all, we have a manifold. So we know what a manifold is, so here it is. And it's covered by coordinate patches. So let me take two of them. Let's say this is the coordinate patch u, and this is the coordinate patch u prime, and maybe they intersect. OK? So uh, this coordinate patch has a local coordinate system, so there's a map. All maps, I think, are called phi. And here's a map called, well, this is a map called, pardon me, phi prime, which is not the derivative of phi. And there are, so this, these are on the manifold. These are open sets in Rn. And so we have local coordinates x1 to xn here and x1 prime to xn prime here. And there is a map. Oh dear, what shall I, I guess not all maps are phi. Let's call this map C, which is defined. I mean, we take the overlap, and here's the overlap, and here's the overlap. And there is a map from, from here to here called C, which takes these coordinates to these coordinates. So it's a manifold. But we want to measure distances on the manifold. And we want to use something like the Pythagoras formula. And therefore, we, we imagine that, we imagine that, that here uh, we are given a metric. So that's g. And what it is is, is it's a matrix-valued function. So here, i, j go from 1 to n. x, x is in this coordinate patch. And this is a positive definite matrix. And, and these are smooth functions, C infinity functions. And one uses that to, to measure the lengths of curves. Um, so if I have a curve that, happen, that happens to lie, here's a curve that lies entirely in here. It is a parametrized curve. So let's say it is tau goes to uh, x of tau. And if I think not of this curve, but of the image of, the, of this curve under phi inverse, then that curve corresponds to this curve. And so then there are coordinates. x1 of tau, think of tau as being time, xn of tau. And according to Pythagoras or something, the length of this curve should equal the integral of the square root of something like the sum of the squares, namely this dx i over d tau, dx j over d tau to the 1 half d tau. OK, so that's, that allows us to define lengths of curves. And now if you know what the lengths of curves mean, uh, then you also know what angles between curves mean, because you look at little arcs of you know, two curves meet, look at that point, look at a little bit of that curve, look at a little bit of that curve. This looks a lot like a Euclidean triangle, and by elementary trig, you calculate the angle. So, so we can calculate both lengths and angles from, from such a formula. The g is supposed to be positive definite, so that this makes sense, and lengths of, uh, lengths of curves are, are uh, positive uh, rather than complex numbers. But in fact, it's very, very interesting and important to consider g's which are um, not positive definite, but merely have non-zero determinant for reasons that Many of you know better than I do. Um, OK, so uh, uh, fine. Uh, so that's what's happening in one coordinate patch. And then if in the other coordinate patch, this same metric is given by uh, a different positive definite matrix. OK, and there is some obvious transformation law that relates this one to this one over here, so that if a curve happens to lie in there, you get the same formula for, for the length, uh, whether you use this, or regardless of whether you use this or that. So that's, that's a Riemannian manifold. Now, uh, Riemannian manifolds have uh, curvature, and they have uh, covariant, der uh, covariant derivatives. Let me, let me describe for a second. Let's see, how long have I spent on this? I should have. Five minutes, maybe I will spend five more, and then then we do something a little more serious. Okay, so um, all right. So first of all, what is a covariant derivative? Suppose simply you're in R n. If you have a function, you can take its gradient, and that's um, that that's a thing with one index. It's a, a vector, okay, a vector function. Well, but you can take the co. I mean, you can take the gradient of that vector function, and that's. Uh, a thing with two indices. That's a, 
if you like, a tensor function of rank two, okay? But then you can take the, the gradient of that, and, and as many, you can take as, a gradient as many times as you like, and in general, if you have a tensor, which simply means, um, I mean, it doesn't simply mean, but for purposes of this uh, pathetic uh, introduction, uh, you have a, a, a list of functions indexed by, um, by some indices, okay? And if you have such a, such a thing, so that's a tensor, and you can take its gradient, uh, and the gradient is indexed by one more index. And so we have tensors of all ranks given by such a thing. That's, that's what happens just in Rn. And there's an analogous thing that I don't want to describe. There's an analogous thing on a Riemannian manifold called the covariant derivative. Okay? So, uh, so I've described we know about that, I've described that, and I've described that. Let me say very quickly what these guys are. Okay, so um, let's, all right. Geometry, uh, geometry on a Riemannian manifold is not quite like geometry in Rn. Suppose, suppose that, um, let's say, this is the xi direction and this is the xj direction. And I carry a flag uh, straight up in the xl direction. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going, to move in the, I'm going to move on a little rectangle in the xi and xj directions and come back to my starting point. And I'm going to try to hold this flag straight up so that it does not tilt. Now, if I'm in Rn, I know what that means. If I'm in a Riemannian manifold, it's not quite so clear what it means. One has to make a careful discussion. But, but one can make a reasonable understanding of what it means to hold this thing as straight as possible. And you find that if you do that, when you come back to your starting point, the flag does not quite point in the original direction. There's a small deviation, which is due to the fact that the Riemannian manifold is curved, um, uh, may be curved. And so uh, if you go around the xi, xj rectangle, uh, and you try to hold the flag upright in the xk direction, you will find a deviation when you come back, and the elf component the, the, um, the, the elf coordinate of the deviation is proportional to the area of this little rectangle. And the, this is the proportionality constant. And this is a tensor of rank 4, because it has four indices. And it has a transformation law, for a nice simple transformation law from one uh, uh, local coordinate patch to another. So that's the, that's the curvature tensor. Okay? And uh, if you were in the... Uh, audience of, of um, Riemann's lecture in whatever it was, 1840-something maybe, uh, then um, maybe you were interested in, in ancient Greek poetry, but by the end of the lecture, you knew that the vanishing of this quantity uh, was equivalent to the, the, um, the manifold being indistinguishable from Euclidean space, the ordinary Euclidean space, with the ordinary notion of distance locally. Okay. Uh, now, of course, this is a complicated object because it has four indices. But on the other hand, uh, if, you have, if you have a tensor, you can contract it. And so what that means is the following. Suppose that you have, take any tensor. Okay. Now, look at this matrix G lower ij. Let's call the inverse of that matrix G upper ij. All right. Then this is, this is a natural thing to do. Take any two of the indices, multiply by the, the inverse matrix G upper IJ and sum, or, 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 IL, and sum over IL. That's analogous to taking the trace of a matrix. It's a natural thing to do. Two observers will agree on, on the trace of a tensor. And, and so um, the, this thing has four indices. One can take its trace. And that gives you a, an, in, an index, uh, a, a tensor with two indices, which is called the, the Ricci curvature. This is the Riemann curvature. This is the Ricci curvature. And then you can contract these two together again and get a number, which is called the scalar curvature. And so this is the very simplest Riemannian invariant. This is a generalization of the Gauss curvature. Okay, In, in two dimensions, this is nothing but the Gauss curvature, maybe times some coefficient that I don't remember, like 3. Um, I don't remember. Uh, in, in, in any event, so, so this, this has the advantage that it is a number. It is a scalar. Okay? And if two manifolds are isometric, if there is a distance-preserving map from one to the other, then uh, 
this number is the same. So this is the, the simplest example of a Riemannian invariant. Okay? Now, it's the simplest example, but there are many others. So for instance, there are lots of manifolds for which this guy is identically zero, but yet the geometry is not Euclid's geometry, and one, one wants to distinguish them. Let me describe how to form all possible local Riemannian invariants. That is, all possible elementary formulas which give you a scalar which is, which is preserved by isometries. Now, what do I mean by an elementary formula? Let me be a little bit more um, precise. So now, all right, now I've described all these things. Um, so by an elementary formula, I'm going to write something like P of G. And what I have in mind is that this P should be a polynomial. Okay, And a polynomial in what? Well, we can take the Gij and we can differentiate them as many times as we like, but we should take only finitely many. I don't want anything that I can't compute by the most elementary kind of formula. So I take, I take this, this uh, Gij, the metric tensor, I differentiate it as many times as I like, and I allow myself, let's say, to take um, the inverse matrix. So uh, I take a polynomial in these guys, and that's what I mean by an elementary formula. Now, how do we make, so question, how do we make elementary formulas that are preserved by, uh, by scalar, I, I'm sorry, that are preserved by uh, isometries, by distance preserving maps of, of Riemannian manifolds? All right. There is a simple procedure to make them all. And uh, it was discovered by Hermann Weyl in maybe 1920. So let me, let me describe the procedure, and it's very easy. OK? So let's start with the curvature tensor. And let's take some covariant derivatives of it, maybe five covariant derivatives. So let's say we, we OK? Uh, now, we can do that again. Maybe we take no derivatives of the of the curvature. Then maybe we take uh, 11 derivatives of the curvature. Oh, god. Um, what's the 11th letter of the alphabet? OK. Whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, god. Um, um, OK. OK? Uh, so to write just the product of these like this is called a tensor product. This, this tensor is a tensor product. And now what I do is I, I, I hope that I have done this in such a way that I have an even number of indices. And I pair these together any way at all. And for instance, Q got paired with B. And so I multiply by G, Q, B, and so on. So I'm multiplying by a lot of Gs, let's say, P was, let's say P was paired with Olaf. So P, Olaf, OK? Um, and I sum over all indices. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a trace or, of a contraction or a trace of tensor products of covariant derivatives of the curvature. Now this is obviously, uh, all right, so this is obviously each of the following things. First of all, it is a number. It is a scalar. I've gotten rid of all the indices by summing. Secondly, it is invariant under isometries because every operation that I performed is a natural thing. The curvature is, is natural, taking covariant derivatives is natural, taking tensor product is natural, and taking contractions is natural. So this is, um, this is then uh, uh, preserved by isometries. It is an elementary formula in the sense that this is a polynomial P of G in, in, the, in the sense that I just wrote down. It is such a thing. Uh, and it is invariant. Fine. The theorem of Hermann Weyl is that every conformal invariant is a linear combination of things like this. Uh, I'm sorry, Riemannian. What, what did I say? Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you, Riemannian. OK. So, so the first, all right, so that's a complete solution to, or at least I, let me regard this as a complete solution to the problem of finding Riemannian invariants.
And now what I would like to do, the first of the two problems that I would like to address is to find the, um, okay, is to find a, corresponding a correspondingly explicit answer to the problem of finding all conformal invariants. So what is a, all right, what is a conformal structure? What is a conformal, a pointwise conformal invariant? Okay. Yes. 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 Um, let me think. Invariants are functions, so you would have a function from the manifold to some abstract Euclidean space in which each coordinate is one invariant. Um, okay, the following is true. Okay, take take a take a, a, a Riemannian manifold and take one point on the Riemannian manifold, and suppose that I tell you all of these invariants. Now I have a, now take another Riemannian. In, manifold and another point on, in it, and suppose that, that the corresponding list is identical. Then there is a map that carries this point, I mean, that carries this manifold to that manifold, taking this point to that point, okay? And it is an isometry to infinite order at this point. Now, let's see, uh, that's, that's an answer in terms of Taylor series to infinite order at one point. Now, if you're talking about the whole manifold instead of Taylor series at one point, then there's some question as to exactly what it means for the invariants to be the same, because you have to have a map already so that, so that the, okay, is it clear? So, um, if you think very carefully about, I mean, try to say it very precisely, it, it, it won't be completely routine to say the full problem precisely if you, okay. Anyway, on the other hand, in practice, usually it, I mean, if, if take, take an n-dimensional sphere and an n-dimensional ellipsoid or take, you know, it, it will in practice be a miracle if, if the first few invariants already fail to distinguish. Pardon the hemming and hawing. Okay. All right. Fine. Okay, now what is a conformal manifold and what is a conformal equivalence? Well, suppose, suppose that I have my manifold uh, and I look at one of these coordinate patches and in the coordinate patch the G is given like this. Okay? Now I'm going to describe a conformal deformation, a conformal deformation of the metric. And what I mean is I'm going to take some function lambda of x, uh, a smooth non-vanishing function, let's say strictly positive, on the manifold, and I'm simply going to multiply this matrix by lambda of x. And I guess I'll multiply this by the corresponding function that I, maybe I should call lambda of x prime, maybe not. Um, okay, but simply I take, I take my metric and I multiply uh, the gij by, by a scalar function. It's not constant, but it is smooth and it's not zero. From, from a starting metric, I then get a new metric, which is the, conf it's the conformal deformation of the metric. Now, if you change from a given metric to a conformal deformation, the lengths of, of curves will change, but the angles between curves will not change. If you like, this, this lambda multiplies inner products, and so two things are, are perpendicular if the inner product is zero, and I don't care whether you multiply that by lambda or not. So angles don't change, but lengths change, okay? Now, two maps, I'm sorry, two Riemannian manifolds are said to be conformally equivalent if there is a map of one manifold to the other which carries one metric to a conformal deformation of the other one, okay? And a conformal structure on a manifold is a thing like this, M equivalence class of G where this denotes the class of all Riemannian metrics which are conformal deformations of a given one. That's a conformal structure. Okay. 
Uh, okay. Now, um, okay. Now let's go back to uh, scalar invariance. And so we've got our polynomial of G. And I want this thing to be a Riemannian invariant in the previous sense, but I also want it to have a nice simple transformation law under conformal deformations. So, uh, so let's say that I compare P of G with P of lambda G. Lambda is a non-vanishing smooth function. Okay? And I'm going to say that this, that, that this P is a conform, a, let's say a pointwise, maybe sometimes I'll omit the word pointwise, but a pointwise conformal invariant of weight w if this is equal to lambda to the w times, uh, times this p of lambda g. OK, that it, it would be nice if, for example, w were 0 so that this is exactly the same as that. But that, that simply can't happen. Because if you take any, take any Riemannian manifold and blow it up by a large constant factor, Locally, it looks, you know, think of a balloon. Blow up the balloon. If you're, if you're an ant living on a, a blown up balloon, uh, the world looks almost flat. The balloon looks almost flat. And so if the W is 0, uh, you will not be able to distinguish the world from, uh, uh, from a flat world, and, and your P will just be identically 0. So there are no interesting invariants of weight 0. But all right, so this is a conformal, a conformal invariant of weight w. And if I have only one, and coming back to your question, if, if I have only one, if I look at only one such, then uh, I'm not going to get much information from it because I don't know what the lambda is. But if I have 50 such, then, uh, then if I compare the list of these with the corresponding list of those, then I will get a lot of information because uh, there's only one parameter to play with the lambda. Okay. Now, the vast majority of invariants are not conformal invariants for a very trivial reason. This, this g is equal to lambda times this g, and lambda is a function. When you differentiate lambda times g, you have to use the product rule. And you will get terms in which the lambda gets differentiated. And so when you have your favorite god-awful mess a la Hermann Weyl, okay, you will find that the transformation law that connects that to that will involve not only lambda, but derivatives of lambda, maybe higher derivatives of lambda. And so it is very unusual for all of those higher derivatives to cancel out and, uh, and produce uh, something like this. But the problem is to find some and, in fact, find them all. That's the problem. So that's, that's the local problem. Um, so I've, I've at least stated the problem. OK. Uh, let me state the, the uh, global problem. So suppose, suppose that we have, um, so th that's a local conformal invariant. What's, what's uh, let's say, an integral or a global conformal invariant? Well, again, I want an elementary formula, P of g. And I want to integrate it with respect to the volume for g. So let me just say this. I mean, if, if you know no differential geometry at all, this is the square root of the determinant of the matrix Gij of x times dx1 dxn. That's, uh, if I put wedges between these, that would be an end form that two observers would agree on. Uh, well, let's not put wedges, because then I'd have to think about the orientation. Um, anyway, that, that's the volume. And what I would like is that the integral on m, uh, on a manifold of dimension n, that this integral should be the same for g and for a conformal deformation. And the problem is to find all such. OK? Uh, well, let me, let me refine the question a little bit. Uh, notice um, dx1 through dxn are lengths. They have the dimension of meters. So this d volume is meters to the power n. So this p of g had better have the dimension of meters to the power minus n. And so far, it needn't. So you, you, look, you, you look at, I mean, this is a polynomial. It's made of a lot of monomials. Each monomial has its own dimension, meters to the whatever. And 
a priori, anything that does not have the dimension meters to the minus n had better just integrate to zero, or you've got complete garbage. Okay? And so let, let me say that I'm only interested in polynomial, for here I'm only interested in polynomials which, which have, for which the P of G has the dimension meters to the minus n. And I won't write down exactly what that means, but I'm only interested in such. Okay. Now, this question has actually arisen in, in particle physics. Uh, now, particle physics is a subject about which um, I don't know anything, so I won't try to explain what I don't know, okay? namely how this arose in particle physics. But two, two physicists, Dazer and Schwimmer, made a very interesting assertion, and they regarded it as obvious or something. I don't quite know how. Um, so let me, let me give you a list of particular polynomials with the property that this integral is obviously conformally invariant. Okay? Obvious method number one. P could be a pointwise conformal invariant of the correct weight, which forces it to have the dimension meters to the minus n. If it's pointwise conformally invariant, this thing had better. I mean, its integral will then be uh, a conformally invariant. That's one possibility. There's a second possibility. Uh, by the way, n is even. If n is odd, there's some very simple argument that shows that there can be no such invariance, okay, other than zero. Uh, so n is even. Okay. So first obvious thing, a pointwise conformal invariant of the right way. Second possibility, p of g, this is a scalar, could be the divergence of a vector field that I'm going to call x of g, which is the same kind of thing as p of g, the same thing, the, the sort of thing that Hermann Weyl uh, described in 1920, except that it has one free index so that instead of being a scalar, it's a vector. So this is a vector field made out of G, and this is its divergence. And of course, the integral of an exact divergence is zero by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So this integral is obviously conformally invariant because it's zero. Thank you very much. Okay? The third obvious thing that you can integrate over the manifold is um, and get something conformally invariant. The third obvious thing is the gauss bonnet integrand. Okay, so let, let me remind you just of the gauss bonnet theorem in uh, in dimension two. The if you have if you have some two-dimensional compact, I should have said this m is compact with no boundary. If you have a two-dimensional uh, compact manifold with no boundary, the integral of the Gaussian curvature is is the Euler characteristic times whatever uh, what is it? 2 pi, 4 pi, some elementary, okay, elementary constant. So there, there, is, there is an elementary expression that you can integrate over the manifold and produce the Euler characteristic of the manifold. And the same thing is true in any even dimension, and we're only interested in even dimensions here. Okay? And, and so there is the, the Pfaffian of the curvature, which I won't describe, but th there is a gauss bonnet integrand, which gives a topological invariant, which is certainly then a conformal invariant. Okay, so there are these three methods of producing, um, of producing uh, uh, integral invariance. And what Dazer and Schwimmer asserted was that, the, um, that every uh, conformal integral invariant is, uh, arises by adding together a pointwise, a pointwise conformal invariant, uh, an exact divergence, and some constant times the gauss bonnet integrand. So take the three obvious ways, put them together, that's all there is. Okay? Uh, and uh, that has interesting consequences in math as well as conceivably physics. Again, I don't, I mean, not only do I not claim to, all right, well, all right, enough. Uh, so that's, that's the conjecture. Now, um, this was a conjecture, they did not prove it. They did not, all right, they, they asserted it. I think they, they, believed it strongly. They believed, I guess, that there was a lot of evidence for it. But after a lot of looking through the physics literature, mathematicians were unable to find anything that suggested any hint of a logical argument. OK. All right. Now, all right, so what is the status of these problems? So that's a, a problem one, find all things like this. Problem two, prove that or disprove it. OK. Now. Uh, for problem one, um, Robin Graham and I, a long time ago, invented a procedure to grind out lots of examples. And 
Graham and uh, two other mathematicians, uh, Toby Bailey and Mike Eastwood, proved that this procedure generates all possible local invariants in odd dimensions. Okay? So if n is odd, there's some procedure that generates all of these. If n is even, it definitely does not generate all invariants, but it generates some. And it happens to generate all those uh, whose dimension is meters to the minus n. So it generates enough to qualify uh, um, to, to be relevant to this. Okay. Now, um, I conjecture that this has, has been proved. Let me be more precise. So I've, I've had in, in Princeton over the last few years a very brilliant student named Spiros Alexakis. And he has produced an argument which he claims is a proof of this. The argument is composed of two parts. There is a very, very striking, brilliant, uh, conceptual part of the proof. And then there is a revolting, massive multiple induction applying the clever idea. All right. Now, uh, so Spiros and I have for many years been in a sort of mutually destructive relationship in which I have been trying to go through his proof word for word and check it. And I am almost but not quite at the end. And I have found occasional, more than occasional mistakes, but they have all been easily repairable, all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, one, of, one of the qualities for which I have a reputation is, is being anal. And so uh, I have checked very, 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 very carefully. Now, uh, what I have checked is almost all of it, but not quite all of it. And if, uh, you know, if there's a fatal error on the last page, I will wring his neck and the, uh, you know, the thing will be over. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think it is right. And uh, I would, maybe I will, I don't think I'll have time actually, but I, will I would like to describe a little bit of the, I mean, of the conceptual part of the proof. Uh, maybe what I will do in the time remaining is describe the procedure for, for producing these guys. Okay, so is, is this clear so far? Sure, other, okay, all right. Now, um, what, what I'm going to do is generalize um, a classical observation going back to I'm not quite sure whom, but definitely very well known, about, uh, let's say, conformal maps of the sphere to itself. Just take the ordinary sphere in Euclidean space with the ordinary metric. But let's say the sphere has dimension greater than 2 so that we're not in the case of one complex variable. Okay. Now, um, th remember, there are, there are linear fractional transformations that are conformal self maps from the sphere to itself. How do you see that? That's, of course, an elementary point, but one has to see it. And, and so um, there is a very nice classical way to see it, and I would just like to show it to you. And what, uh, what Graham and I did is, is just to generalize it a little and make calculations. OK, so, so the goal is to, uh, for the moment, uh, to see why there are um, linear fractional transformations that are conformal self-maps of the unit sphere in Rn. Okay? Now, to do this, let's just use projective coordinates. So let's say uh, the sphere, I, I mean, if, if we have an n-dimensional sphere, then let's say we are in Euclidean space of dimension n plus 1. And that, guess what? That's the equation of the unit sphere. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, let's use projective coordinates, OK? So let's introduce, let's say, x0, x1, x, n plus 1, where, uh, let's say, little xj is equal to capital XJ divided by capital X, 0. OK? Then the sphere corresponds to Uh, 
this sphere corresponds to um, x1 squared plus, plus xn squared minus x0 squared equals 0. OK? Uh, and furthermore, uh, well, all right. So, so there we are in dimension n plus 2. We're interested in the, in the sphere of dimension n sitting in Rn plus 1. But we're now looking at it as being a cone sitting in dimension n plus 2. Now, this is, of course, a very nice um, indefinite uh, quadratic form on Rn. Associated with this, there is an obvious metric, which is the metric uh, dx1 squared plus, et cetera, plus dxn squared minus dx0 squared. N plus 1, I'm sorry. That mistake will occur over and over again. OK? So here we are in dimension n plus 2 when we look at this metric. So of course, this is a flat Lorentz metric. OK? Uh, and we're related to, to that light cone. Fine. Now, uh, let us, now, aha, what were these linear fractional transformations? Where do they come from? Well, they come from linear transformations, A, in O n plus 1, 1. They are maps from R n plus 2 to R n plus 2 that preserve this quadratic form. Now, such, such things also, of course, preserve the light cone, let's call it gamma. All right. So if A is in here, if it's a linear map in here, it, it preserves gamma. Okay. And, um, and furthermore, of course, this is, this is homogeneous of degree 1. It commutes with dilations because it's a linear map. And so it collapses from a map. Right, ah. To begin with, this is a map from Rn plus 2 to Rn plus 2. But of course, it's also a map from gamma to gamma. And because it's homogeneous at degree 1, it collapses to a map from the sphere to the sphere. OK? Um, uh, and, and, so, and of course, that map is a linear fractional transformation because a linear fractional transformation is just something which in projective coordinates is a linear transformation. All right. Now, why is it conformal? Why is it conformal? Let us look at this metric restricted to gamma. Now, A obviously preserves this metric. So it preserves this metric restricted to gamma. Now, something not completely expected happens, if, if you haven't thought about this at all, which is the following. Normally, I mean, think of a, a positive definite metric. Think of the Euclidean metric on R3. Think of a surface sitting in R3 and restrict the, um, the metric to the surface. It is, again, a metric. Okay. But if you restrict this metric, this indefinite metric, to this gamma, it is not at all, uh, it, it is not a metric anymore. It fails to be non-degenerate. Okay. Instead, it has the following form. Okay. The restriction of this metric to gamma so let me, call, let me call this metric G. And G restricted to gamma has the following form. It is x0 squared, that's a function, times uh, the sum from 1 to n plus 1 of d little xj squared, where little, x, little xj is given like that. Aha, this is the usual round metric. And this is. Uh, um, just some scalar factor. So this, oh, all right, A has to preserve this thing. Well, um, so A does not preserve this guy, but it does preserve this guy times some funny scalar. That means that this guy is transformed by being multiplied by some funny scalar. That's what we called the lambda before, and that's the conformal deformation. So this is a way of producing, um, of producing conformal uh, self maps on the sphere by means of linear fractional transformations. OK, so that's, I, I think that's a nice way of seeing that such things exist. But of course, it's just a little elementary exercise. OK, now how are we going to make use of this in the curved case? Let, let's try to generalize this to, uh, um, well, let's see what kind of generalizations we can make of this thing. All right. 
So now uh, let's imagine that we have uh, a manifold, let me call it m tilde, of dimension n plus 2. And we're going to try to use it to understand a conformal structure in dimension n. OK? So it, it's going to generalize that thing. So, on, so this is a manifold with a metric called, let's say, capital G. Now, in addition to, so this metric is a Lorentz, a Lorentz metric with lots of pluses and one minus. OK, just like that. There's go, now, uh, we wanted to think of these as projective coordinates. And so there have to be some dilations so that we can mod out by dilations and regard these as projective coordinates for, for little x's. And so I want to imagine that there's a one parameter group of dilations, del t taking m tilde to m tilde. OK? So, so this is a dilation. So del uh, 1 equals the identity map, and del st equals del s del t. And uh, let's see, what else? I've probably forgotten plenty. Um, oh, yes. And this g should be homogeneous of degree 2 with respect to the dilations delta t. OK? All right, now uh, let's come over here. So there's the, no, let's, let's come over here. All right. Fine. Uh, now, if this is a one parameter group, it has an infinitesimal generator. And that's a vector field, which I'm going to call T. This is the infinitesimal generator of the dilation uh, of the dilation, well, of the one parameter group of dilations. So if you like, what is that? Given a point x in, in this manifold m tilde, uh, as a function, look at its dilate by t. And so that's a path. That's a parametrized path. And the velocity of that path at, at time uh, t equals 1, where the thing starts out, is, is, um, is the velocity vector. It's t. That, it's that velocity vector. So that's the infinitesimal generator of dilations. And there is then a natural scalar function, which is the norm squared, the length squared of this infinitesimal generator with respect to the, the metric. If you work out what that is in this example, you will discover that the norm squared of this uh, uh, infinitesimal generator is precisely this function. Okay. OK? And so therefore, um, we should take gamma to be the set of all points where this thing is equal to 0. And that's precise, that specializes precisely to that gamma. And this gamma is precisely um, homogeneous of, of degree 1. And so this gamma collapses. Uh, on, I mean, you can think of this gamma as being a line bundle over, uh, over something of dimension n. We started in dimension n plus 2. We passed to gamma, which has dimension n plus 1. And we modded out by uh, one parameter group. Uh, and so that's of dimension n. And so this is some manifold m of dimension n. OK? Now, uh, just as. Just as in the Euclidean case, you can take g restricted to gamma, and you can discover that in suitable coordinates, this is equal to fu some funny scalar function times uh, a metric, a positive definite metric on, uh, on m. Just as. Uh, well, just as what I erased in the flat case, g restricted to gamma equals x0 squared, some funny scalar, times the sum from 1 to n plus 1 of dxj squared. OK. So what we have got is a positive definite metric times some funny scalar function. This produces then a conformal structure, that is, a, a positive definite metric defined up to multiplication by non-vanishing smooth scalars. Okay, 
So this is a way of passing from this situation to an n-dimensional conformal structure. OK, now I want to ask the inverse problem. Given a conformal structure down here, is there a, a Riemannian manifold G, a, a Lorentz manifold here, non-degenerate with that signature, such that when you perform this construction, you get the given, uh, you get the given uh, uh, conformal structure. Okay. Now, uh, that problem is highly underdetermined for the following reason. In this construction, I am only interested in what G is doing when you restrict it to gamma. Away from gamma, I'm assuming nothing about G. That's not so good. I, what I'd like to do is regard this as an initial value problem for a PDE. And this is an initial condition, because I'm telling you what, something about what G is doing on this set gamma of co-dimension 1. I, I would like to, to have some PDEs for which this is the initial condition. Okay, A little bit of gamesmanship. How shall we guess the PDEs? Well, how many unknowns do we have? We have, uh, n, I mean, we have of the order of n squared unknowns, because uh, the unknown is a metric in dimension n plus 2. Okay, So we would like to have about n squared equations. So um, which invariant things shall we write down? And, and the answer is, um, So the answer is the Ricci curvature, simply because it has, it has two indices. And therefore, in dimension n, or in this case, in dimension n plus 2, it has just as many indices as the metric. And so I will declare that this should be 0 for the metric G. And so I will say that capital G is an ambient metric for the, just, just a word, OK, two words, an ambient metric for a given conformal structure if this happens, this happens, and when you go through this construction, the, conform the, uh, the conformal structure you get on the manifold is the one that you started with. OK? Now, uh, what's the, all right, so I have, I have what, two minutes left, maybe? No, we Zero. at uh, 05, so oh, five, five minutes left. OK, I'm rich. OK. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, all right. This looks like bad news. Ricci zero is, is the Einstein equation. Uh, this is a hard problem. Okay. It is not well understood. That's very bad. If it were understood, we, could com I mean, what, we couldn't compute with it very well. Uh, you know, imagine that I give you the initial conditions for the Einstein equations, and I ask you to, to come back and produce for me the solutions of the Einstein equations. You may or may not be able to say something, but it won't be very easy. We're out of the realm of elementary formulas. However, what I want to think about is that uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to, I, mean, I, I actually don't care about the whole metric everywhere. I just want to expand it in a Taylor series to infinite order about m, or I'm sorry, about gamma. If I can do that, then I can construct anything I want on gamma. Ultimately, I'm interested in understanding what's happening on M. Okay. So let's imagine that I'm not interested in this thing being exactly 0, but I want it to vanish to infinite order on gamma. And I will say that two metrics are, essential, are equivalent. I will regard them as being the same if they agree, if, if their difference vanishes to infinite order on gamma. Okay. Now there's an obvious notion then of equivalence, and the equiv uh, let, let me not describe exactly what it is. Two of these are isomorphic if some obvious thing happens. Up to isomorphism, in odd dimension, it turns out that for any uh, conformal structure here, there is one and only one ambient metric in the sense of formal power series. And furthermore, you can read off the formal power series by el uh, of the ambient metric by elementary formulas from the, uh, uh, from, from the conformal, uh, from the Taylor series of the conformal metric. So staying in the world of elementary formulas, um, one, can, one can find the one and only ambient metric. Okay? And now suppose you want to produce uh, scalar invariants or invariant differential operators or whatever you like 
uh, which have conformal invariance. What do you do? You start with a conformal metric. Damn it, uh, it it's allowed to uh, undergo conformal deformation, so you don't know what to do. Aha, now we do know what to do. Pass to the ambient metric. That's an honest to god metric. If two, if two conformal structures are conformally equivalent, their ambient metrics are isometric. Therefore, take any elementary formula that produces an, uh, a scalar from, from a metric, from an ordinary metric, not a conformal metric, and apply that, that procedure to the ambient metric. That will obviously produce a conformal invariant of the original conformal structure. So that's what Graham and I did way back when. And we, we wrote down lots of examples, which I could barely um, remember then. And I certainly don't remember now. Uh, but but one, could, I mean, one could write down lots of examples. And, um, and we conjectured that um, in odd dimensions, all the invariants, uh, all the local conformal invariants come this way. And uh, 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 Bailey, Eastwood, and Graham proved that not so long after. So that, that took care of the odd dimensional case. Let me just mention that uh, somebody else, Rod Gover, has taken care of the even dimensional case also, essentially. Um, um, and I don't have time to describe. Um, I have maybe two minutes left. I would like to say a little bit about the, the um, the ideas that I think are so striking from, from Alexakis. OK, so we have, we have a polynomial in a metric. And uh, its integral is conformally invariant. What the hell are we supposed to do with that? Well, let's, um, so let's take our conformal, so p of g. Uh, let's multiply this by lambda. Let's take lambda to be e to the t omega. OK? The integral of this is independent of t. And so if we differentiate with respect to t, we will get something whose integral is 0. Let us differentiate with respect to t and then, te then set t equals 0. So when we set t equals 0, this goes away. But we will get maybe some derivatives of, of omega. So we will have a polynomial in g in derivatives of g and derivatives of omega. And we know that that always integrates to 0. And we would like to make some use of that. I don't have time, and you don't want to hear the full story of, of how you make use of that. But just how do you get it started? If this integrates to 0, it must be the divergence of something. That's fine. But then you immediately get the question, so what? Well, so the answer to the so what is a very long story. I'm going to tell you the beginning of the very long story. If this is a divergence, then it can be proven to be a divergence by using certain elementary rules. These rules are not, uh, are not sensitive to the dimension. Therefore, if this formula is true in dimension n, it is also true in all higher dimensions. Aha, if it is true in all higher dimensions, then, um, then we can look at this formula and again try to make, just as we did before, uh, we made a conformal deformation of g and took a derivative. We can do that again. Because in remember, this has dimension meters to the minus little n. In dimension higher than n, that's highly unnatural. And, and so one can take derivatives of that and exploit that. And you get formulas in which the dimension, capital N, is a parameter. Now, the, the, now the, the, the metric lives in dimension capital N, but you can restrict attention to the product of your favorite metric in dimension little n and, let's say, a flat torus in all the other dimensions. So therefore, we have a formula living in the original dimension little n in which the dimension capital N is a parameter. You can then let capital N tend to infinity, and you can extract a formula which Spiros calls the super divergence formula. Never mind even what it is. Um, this, this formula um, simplifies by a cascade of miraculous cancellations. Um, and, and one gets something that, in principle, can start, you can start to use in order to relate this formula to the structure of the original P of G 
and, and you find something or other that you can subtract from it, either an exact divergence or an exact uh, conformal invariant, such that uh, you have made progress and you have removed some terms. And so there's some notion of, of what are the worst terms. And there's a multiple induction making the worst term less and less awful until finally there are no terms left. And there's also no time left, so thank you. Okay, oh, a good question. I was confused about one step. The step where you went from uh, mn to mn plus 1. Do you have to be able to embed your manifold in a higher dimensional manifold? Oh, oh, um, let's see. Uh, you can always embed because this is, I mean, so f take, take your manifold and take, let's say, the, uh, the Cartesian product of your manifold with an interval. You've now embedded it. Um, you don't worry about what happens globally. I mean, inside, sort of, you know, think of the sphere. Uh, the sphere is inside a little, color, a little colored neighborhood around the sphere, a little spherical shell. Uh, you'd like to fill in the spherical shell because that feels good, but you don't actually need to do it for this. This is all uh, formal power series about the sphere. And so if there is nothing far away from the sphere, even, even inside, that's OK. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry? Uh, my, my impression from the beginning was that you, you make local computations at one point. Oh, you make local computations at one, at one point. point. So what is that? Oh, so, um, OK. Uh, M, could, M could be, let's say, so the original, I mean, so let's say this thing, a positive definite metric on a manifold. Let's say you've got a coordinate patch, little, little neighborhood, so, but, but it's and it's, it's completely local. OK, so, so one, can ask, one can ask global global questions about this, and they're hard, and, and I don't know answers to them. But, but you don't, this is orthogonal to that somehow. The construction of the effect is global. You, 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 the construction of this. OK, going this way, it's global. global. Yeah. But you are not sure that you can go uh, the other way. Because, no. Uh, right. And uh, what was the reason that you took the differential equation from the uh, Ricci uh, okay. tensor? So, um, OK, so Except I. Of, uh, they have the right number of equations. Simple as that. And, and it, should be, uh, you know, it, it should be something Riemannian invariant and, and, and hopefully easy. And so, I mean, the Ricci, there's nothing obviously wrong with the Ricci. No, no. So we tried, uh, so, uh, we tried, let me be a little more precise. In those days, uh, uh, Robin Graham was a young man. And I could tell him, gee, this looks interesting. Why don't you compute it out? And it's a horrible computation with formal power series. But he did it, and it worked. But again, this differential equation, actually, what you do, you do simply a differentiation of these uh, differential equations, and yes. you get high and higher powers. Exactly, and, and exactly. And, and so there were, there were funny tricks. You, you, I mean, we, I thought that either it wouldn't work, or just at each stage, um, the, nth der, you know, the, the kth derivative is just obviously determined by, by previous derivatives. There's one value of k, which or, uh, which is maybe n over 2 or something like that. I don't remember. There is one value of k at which that actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and, and then some cancellation has to happen. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there's just some obstruction. And you can't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But that cancellation happens. Mm -hmm. and in uh, what? Uh, in, the, uh, in odd dimension? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's dimension. I'm sorry. There, there is n over 2, and then there is n. Those are the two critical values of k. And I guess what I'm describing is at n. And at n over 2, in odd dimensions, nothing happens because n over 2 is not even an integer. Yeah. Uh, so um, so it, it's, it's curious. There are not many differential equations that have the property that, um, th that you can read off the full Taylor expansion of the solution uh, uh, at, at an initial, you know, at some in initial manifold from the initial data. Usually that doesn't happen. But, but this is some equation in which, there, for formal solutions, it does happen. OK. Other questions? Letters. Thank you. Thank you.